Well, thank you uh, to Colonel Williams and to his wife Vera and to all of you for the chance to be back here. This is my, I think, fourth or fifth time here, and it's a real privilege to be with you. I salute what you do and what you do for our country, and that's why I'm here, and I hope that what I share with you today can make a difference. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug, a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive, and we often have a hard time believing that the simple choices that we make in our life each day, like what we eat, how we respond to stress, whether or not we smoke, how much we exercise, and perhaps most important, how much love and intimacy we have in our lives. That these simple choices can make such a powerful difference in our lives, but they really do. And in our research over the past 35 years, we've used very expensive, high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific technology to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and often ancient interventions. And what we've, what we've found is that uh, these simple choices can influence our lives much more quickly than we had once realized in ways that not only help us live longer, but also to help us live better. And they include what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. And it all really goes back to saying a very simple, but in many ways radical question, radical in the meaning to get to the root of something. You know, a square root sign used to be called a radical. And so it's radical in the sense we're really addressing the causes of why we get sick and why we stay healthy. And I got interested in doing this work in, uh, I guess, almost 30 years ago when I was a medical student. I was learning how to do bypass surgery with uh, Michael DeBakey, the, uh, the legendary heart surgeon. We'd cut people open, we'd bypass their clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured and they would go home, and more often than not, they would do the same things that had caused the problem in the first place. They'd keep eating junk food, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't exercise, they didn't know how to handle stress, and so on. And more often than not, their bypasses would clog up, and so we'd cut them open again and bypass the bypass, sometimes multiple times. So for me, bypass surgery became a metaphor of an incomplete approach, that we were literally bypassing the problem. We weren't really addressing its cause. And it's a very simple idea, but a very powerful one. And that is, if you don't treat the cause of a problem, in this case, heart disease, but really any problem, then more often than not, it comes back again, either in the same form or in a different form. Or you have painful choices. And so what, we, what I wondered was, if we could turn off the faucet, if we could treat the cause, what would happen? And what we found is that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized, if we simply stop doing what's causing the problem. And to a large degree, it's the lifestyle choices that we make each day. And in this sense, lifestyle can only help prevent disease, but it can actually be a, a, an even more powerful treatment, either in collaboration with drugs and surgery, and often as a replacement for them. And all the things I'm going to share with you this morning were thought impossible before we started doing them. It was thought, for example, that once you had heart disease, it could only get worse. And maybe you could slow down the rate at which it got worse, but it, it couldn't get better. And we were able to show that you could actually reverse it, not just stop it, but actually make it better. So instead of getting worse and worse, people could get better and better. This is a, we did a series of studies. This was the most rigorous one called the Lifestyle Heart Trial. And what you're looking at here in the upper left is a, it's a frame from an x-ray movie called an angiogram. And it shows where the block, blockage is, where that arrow is, where it's narrowed, is because the artery that's feeding the heart is clogged up. A year later, it's less clogged. And because the blood flow to the heart is actually a fourth power function of the diameter of the artery, even moderate changes in the blockage can cause big changes in blood flow to the heart. And the blood flow is really the bottom line in heart disease because the blood carries the oxygen which feeds your heart. And you can see here, blue and black, this is called a cardiac PET scan, means there's no blood flow. And a year later, orange and white is essentially normal. And that's representative of the kinds of changes that we're seeing. We found it overall that the people who didn't go through our program, their arteries got more clogged after one year and even more clogged after five years. But when people went, made these lifestyle changes, they showed some reversal after one year and even more after five years. Now, to put a human face on that, we've trained now through our nonprofit institute over 50 hospitals and clinics around the country. Most recently, we trained the Cleveland Clinic not far from here, which is the largest uh, cardiac program on the planet. But we've also trained 10 hospitals in West Virginia. West Virginia is number one in the country uh, not in football, unfortunately, but in uh, heart disease. And uh, we've trained 10 hospitals there. It's like, if we can make it there, we can make it anywhere, right? And this is a, a man who the hospital had a press conference to announce the program. This is one of the patients who went through it. It's just a one-minute excerpt of what he said. They sent me a clip of it. But I wanted to put a human face on it because it shows you why I'm so passionate about doing this work and what a powerful difference it can make in someone's life. I'm no longer using a cane or a wheelchair in uh, November.
November of 2001, I was using a cane to walk with, and I had to have the humiliating experience of riding a wheelchair around Walmart. Now, I didn't like that. I wasn't going to settle for that. I knew there must be a better way. And thank God I found a better way. I no longer have to take my diabetes medication. In fact, my total medication has been reduced by 75%. I had trouble getting to my mailbox uh, without having uh, chest pain. But uh, now I am walking at least two miles a day. I ride my stationary bike anywhere from 8 to 10 miles a day. Now, this is not best case. This is representative of what happens when people make these changes. Many doctors are shocked because these are things we don't really learn much about in medical school, and yet they make such a powerful difference. I thought when we began doing this work that the younger patients would do better who didn't have such severe disease, but I was wrong. It wasn't a function of how old they were or how sick they were. The more people change their lifestyle, the more they improved in, in every way we could measure. And that's a powerful message as well, because it's saying as long as you're still alive, it's never too late to begin making these changes. We, um, we found a 40% reduction in their cholesterol levels. This is comparable to, to what you get with drugs like Lipitor and Zocor and things like that, but without the costs and without the side effects. Uh, Lipitor, $13 billion were spent last year alone, and yet we can accomplish the same thing through changing lifestyles. So at a fraction of the cost, and the only side effects are good ones. So then we looked at prostate cancer. Prostate cancer kills more men every year. It's the most common cancer other than skin cancer. And yet what's interesting is that uh, we found that we can actually stop or reverse it through the same lifestyle changes that could reverse heart disease. We did the study in collaboration with the chair of urology at UCSF, where I'm a professor, and at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, one of the leading cancer centers. And we took men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer who had elected not to be treated for reasons unrelated to our study so we could then randomly divide them into two groups and look at the effects of lifestyle changes alone without being confounded by chemo and radiation and surgery. And what we found is after a year, the PSA, which is a marker for prostate cancer, went up or got worse in the group that didn't make changes, went down or got better in the group that did. We found again that the more people changed their lifestyle and their diet, the lower their PSA levels went in both groups. The more you change, the more you improve. When we looked at the tumor growth it itself, we found that it was inhibited 70% in the group that made these changes, compared to only 9% in the control group, a huge difference. And one of the most interesting slides, we found that the more people changed their diet and lifestyle, the more it directly stopped or caused the tumor to begin shrinking. The more you change, the more you improve. And we even looked at the tumor activity using a, a, a new test called MR spectroscopy, as, long, as well as MRI. And you can see the tumor activity shown in red is beginning to shrink after a year as well as the PSA going down. And so here again, these simple changes can make such a huge difference. In many cases, not only working as well as drugs and surgery, but in this case, even better. So then we wondered, what are some of the mechanisms to explain why these changes are occurring? And so we looked at their genes. And as Colonel Williams mentioned, we found that we could actually change the gene expression. In other words, over 500 genes in just three months were changed, and in every case in a good way, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes that promote heart disease, prostate cancer, breast cancer in women, diabetes, and so on. You could turn them off, just like that. Now, this is a, um, a picture of what that looks like. These are all genes that promote cancer. Red is turned on, three months later, green is turned off. Can you see the dramatic difference? Just from changing diet and lifestyle. No drugs, no surgery, just what we eat and how we live. Meditation also plays a powerful role. Um, I like this cartoon. And this is a study that showed that, look at non-meditators in red, after eight weeks of meditation, it gets more green, even more green after long-term meditation, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes. <clears throat> this is just from meditation alone. Now, sometimes, you know, exercise is something you got to, you know, it makes you feel kind of macho and so on. It's good. Um, and you got to eat, so it's just a question of what. But meditation is one of those things that people still find a little bit either maybe wimpy or or uh, puzzling, or weird, or whatever. But meditation is simply the practice of bringing your awareness to one thing. It can be anything. Traditionally, it's a sound. And the sounds are very similar. And you find them in religious and spiritual uh, areas, as well as in meditation. So 
the word one or om or shalom or salam or amin or amen. They all begin with an O or an A. They end with an M or an N. They're just very soothing sounds. And you know, if you have any kids, you find yourself humming to them to put them to sleep. And so when you meditate, you bring your mind to one focus. And your mind will wander, and you bring it back. And it wanders, and you bring it back over and over again. And any time you can focus energy, you gain power. Think about it. I mean, a laser is just focused or coherent light. All the waves are in step. You can burn through steel. You can bounce it off the moon. Uh, uh, I don't know about you. When I was little, we used to have a magnifying glass, and you could you know, focus the sun's rays and burn through a piece of paper, or you could you know, torture your little brother, or whatever. Um, <laughs> but any time you can focus energy, you gain power. And, and if you've ever done any martial arts, which I've done for many years, when you can focus your energy, when you punch and you focus it on your two knuckles, you can make, break a brick or break a, a board. And so mental energy is really no different than physical energy. And so when you can focus your mental energy, you gain more power over your body. And this showed, for example, that you can actually change your genes just by learning how to meditate for eight weeks. And whatever you do, it, you do it better when you can focus, whether it's food or whether it's in the boardroom or in sports. You know, world-class athletes use meditation now because in the Olympics, you know, which we're just finishing, um, at a world-class level, the physical differences between athletes are not that great. It's really a mental game. And I'm sure in, 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 in your level of, of work, at the level you are here at the Army War College, you know, you're all really smart. It's really how, you, how well can you focus yourself. Discipline is all about providing that sense of focus. That's what you all do so well. Meditation can take that a step higher, and Colonel Williams and his group can show you how to do that. Now, our telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. As your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. And Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn is a professor at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, where I'm at. And she got the Nobel Prize in medicine three years ago for discovering telomerase. And telomerase is an enzyme that repairs your telomeres, which, again, are the ends of your chromosomes. And she did a pioneering study a few years ago, and she found that women who were under chronic emotional stress the more stress they reported feeling, and the longer they reported feeling stress, the shorter their telomeres got. So it was the first study showing that chronic stress can really shorten your lifespan. And this made headlines around the world. But what was most interesting to me was that it wasn't the external stressor that was the primary determinant, it was how they reacted to it. So you could have two women who were in, these are women, by the way, who were caretakers of, of kids with uh, autism or parents with Alzheimer's. You could have two women in a very similar situation but one was adapting to it. They, had, they were meditating, they were exercising, they, were, they had social support, they were coping with the stress, and the other ones weren't. And it wasn't the external stressor that determined how short their telomeres were, it was how well they coped with it. So you, by definition, you know, in the kind of military work that you do, are under intense stress, particularly if you're in, in, in uh, combat. But how you react to that stress is not so much a function of what happens to you, it's how you react to it. And when you practice these techniques on a regular basis, what happens is you, you react in healthier ways. People often say things like, you know, Dean, I used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily. I don't know if that sounds familiar to anybody here. Um, but now my fuse is longer. It's, so it's not like you have to hold your anger in and make yourself miserable or explode and make everyone else around you miserable. You just don't, it doesn't bother you as much. Your threshold goes up for what, what causes you to feel stress. And so, if you can be in an environment that everyone else is all stressed out and you keep your cool, that's what people are looking for in a leader. And it enables you to make decisions much more uh, clearly and much more uh, effectively when you can focus and keep in your center of, of, of inner peace that way. So we were at a conference together, Dr. Blackburn and I, and I said, you know, if chronic stress can make your telomeres shorter, maybe stress management and changing diet and lifestyle can make it longer. And she said, well, no one's ever done that. I said, well, that makes, I love doing stuff like that. Let's find out. So we did, and we found that we can make the telomerase 30% increased in three months just by making these same diet and lifestyle changes. And we published that in one of the leading uh, uh, international cancer journals. We're about to publish a five-year follow-up to that, not just looking at the enzyme, the telomerase, but the actual telomeres. And we're finding now for the first time we can actually make telomeres longer, by about 10%, whereas the control group, as what usually happens to people, they got shorter. As your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. As your telomeres get longer, your life gets longer. And here again, we found the more people change, the longer their telomeres got, regardless at any age, regardless of how old they were. So that's, again, a very empowering and hopeful message. So our genes are a predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. And so often I hear people say, oh, I've got bad genes, there's not much I can do. You know, when President Clinton was, uh, had a, he had bypass surgery, his bypass clogged up, 
and his own uh, doctors said, you know, it's all in his genes, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And I've been working with President Clinton since he took office in 1993, and we trained the chefs that cook for him at, uh, at the White House and on Air Force One and in Camp David and at the uh, Navy Mess. And, and I've been working with him for a long time, so I sent him a note. I said, you know, I say this not to blame you, but to empower you, but the friends I value the one, most are the ones who tell me what I need to hear, not really necessarily what I want to hear. And you need to know that it's not all in your genes, and there's a lot you can do about it. And you're not, otherwise you're just a victim, and you're not a victim. And so he began making these changes, and he's been doing really well. And so just knowing that we can actually change our gene expression in hundreds of genes in three months is very empowering for many people to know that, because you can. And so if your mother and your father and your sister and your brother and your aunts and uncles all died early from heart disease, you're genetically more likely to get it. It just means that you need to make bigger changes to prevent it than someone else might. But if you're willing to do that, it's almost always preventable and even reversible in most cases. Now, we then looked at something called angiogenesis. And when a tumor grows, it secretes substances, in this case, a substance called VEGF, that tells blood, uh, blood vessels to grow to feed the tumor. Because tumors grow so quickly, they need their own blood supply. And if you can disrupt the blood supply, you can kill the tumor without the kind of toxicities that come from the usual kinds of chemotherapy. And there are new classes of drugs called anti-angiogenesis drugs, like Avastin and Nexavar and others, that are extremely, they're $100,000 a year per person to take. We found that we could, we could lower VEGF by the same degree that a drug can within, again, just by changing lifestyle within a relatively short period of time. By, red is the group that uh, was in the control group. Blue is the group that went through our program. We can lower it on by almost 80% just by changing diet and lifestyle. Now, let's talk a moment about what enables people to make sustainable changes. A lot of people say, yeah, that sounds great, but it's really hard to change your lifestyle. And it is hard. But we've learned what enables people to, to make these changes. And it's not what I thought. I, it's not about fear of dying. It's about joy of living. That, if it's fun, if it makes you feel good, if it involves love, then you're much more likely to do it. If, you know, because, and then when we can help people connect the dots between what they do and how they feel, it's like, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do this, I don't feel so good. So maybe I'll do more of this and less of that. And then it comes out of your own experience, not because some doctor or some book told you. And then it becomes sustainable. Fear is not sustainable. And risk factor modification, you know, Get your cholesterol down so you don't get a heart attack. You know, lower your blood pressure so you don't get a stroke. Quit smoking so you don't get lung cancer. That doesn't work. Fear is not a sustainable motivator. It's not a sustainable motivator for yourself, and it's not a sustainable motivator for the people that you command. And I'll come back to that. Okay? In the short run, when you're scared, you'll do pretty much anything. Like when someone's had a heart attack, they'll do pretty much anything that their doctor or their nurse or their dietitian tells them to do for maybe a month or so. And then the denial comes back. I mean, what's the, what's the mortality rate in this room? 100%, right? I don't want to be the first to break the news to you. We're all going <laughs> to die. It's one per person, right? But it's not something you think about most of the time because it's too scary. So efforts to try to motivate people to change that are fear-based, like fear of dying, fear of something horrible like a heart attack or cancer, are not sustainable because you don't want to think about it. So you don't. But joy is very different. If you feel good, you'll do it. So fear is not sustainable, but joy is. This goes back to the first dietary intervention when God said, don't eat the apple. That didn't work very well. And uh, that was God talking, so we're not going to do better that. We talk about chain of command here. So I, um, I think the message here is that fear is not sustainable, in, in any, in, no matter who's giving the orders. And if you tell a teenager or a kid that smoking is dangerous, that just makes it cool, right? Like James Dean on a Harley. So not only is it not helpful, it's counterproductive. So fear is not only not sustainable, it's often actually counterproductive to what we want to accomplish. The fortune teller says, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell. I, I like this cartoon. Now, you, some people say, well, you know, why bother with all this kind of touchy-feely stuff? It's kind of like that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember years ago when uh, the guy comes down, he does all his martial arts, and Harrison Ford just takes out a gun and shoots him. It's like, why, why screw around all this touchy-feely stuff where you can just take a Lipitor or a pill and be done with it? And the idea is that taking a pill is easy and everyone will do it. But changing diet and lifestyle is difficult, if not impossible. But actually, the data show just the opposite. Only 30% of people are taking Lipitor three months, or Zocor, or any of the statin drugs, just three months after they're prescribed. <clears throat> even if someone else is paying for it, even if they have no side effects. And the drugs work. They really get your cholesterol down. Why don't they take it? Because it doesn't make you feel better. Again, you're taking a pill to get your cholesterol down, to prevent something really bad, like a heart attack, that you don't want to think about, so you stop thinking about it and you don't take it. 
But the paradox is it's actually easier to make bigger changes in lifestyle than just taking a pill. Because most people find they feel so much better so quickly when they make these changes, because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic that we've been talking about, that it reframes the reason for making it from fear of dying to joy of living. Now, there's no point in giving up something that you like unless you get something back that's even better and quickly. I mean, we're all here, it's a beautiful day, you could be doing a hundred other things, but you're here, hopefully because what you're getting is worth giving up what you're not doing. And so when we can help, part of the value of science is to help people understand what a powerful difference these simple changes can make. And because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, you don't have to wait long to see the, the benefits. So when you eat healthier, when you manage stress, when you exercise, when you have more love in your life, your brain gets more blood and more oxygen. You think more clearly, you have more energy, you need less sleep. Now you all know the other end of that spectrum. When you have a big Thanksgiving feast or a Christmas pig out, how do you feel an hour or two later? Sleepy, right? Like you want to take a nap? Because your brain is literally getting less blood and less oxygen. So it works the other direction. Your skin gets more blood when you make these changes. So let me just move this over so my clicker will work. You can actually grow so many new brain cells when you change your lifestyle that your brain can get measurably bigger. That was thought impossible just a few years ago. When I was in medical school, we were taught you, you're born with a certain number of brain cells. And if you go out and have a nice binge on a weekend or something, have a couple six packs, you burn off a few thousand brain cells, you never get them back, right? I'm sure you've heard that before. It turns out it's not true. Your brain can grow those, same, those cells back, which is good news, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> And just walking, I mean, one study showed, for example, walking for a half hour a day, you know, three hours a week, can grow so many new brain neurons in three months in older people, their brains get bigger. That's a great motivator, you know, because when your brain gets bigger, you get smarter, and you can think clearer. It gives you a competitive edge over people who aren't doing that. It doesn't take much. And although we tend to think about diet as what we can have, I much prefer more to think about in terms of, you know, what, it, what, what we can have that really is not only tastes good, but is good for you. And some of my favorite substances are actually Cause neuro neurogenesis just means it causes your brain to grow more blood cells, more, more brain cells. So chocolate and tea and blueberries make your brain bigger. Uh, on the other hand, what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. So saturated fat and sugar and nicotine and so on uh, kill brain cells. Moderate alcohol actually makes your brain grow one or two drinks a day. More than two drinks a day kills your brain cells. Uh, stress management makes your brain bigger. Chronic stress makes it smaller moderate exercise, and so on. And believe it or not, frequent sex actually increases neurogenesis. So part of my prescription for you today, um, <laughs> you go home and you talk to your spouse. Now, this is not entirely a joke. That Part of the, the benefit of being at the Army War College, and Colonel Williams and I have talked about this, is to reconnect with the people that, that, you most, that most matter to you, your spouse, your wife, your husband, your lover, whoever. And that time is as important to you as the time that you spend exercising, the time you spend studying, the time you spend doing other stuff that you do, okay? So if you need an excuse, use me and say, Dr. Orner said, we have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> because it's good for you, it really is. It's good for your brain. This is a study, they, they did this in rats, they couldn't get any volunteers from humans because they killed them at the end to look at their brains. But, um, <laughs> But you can see in the brain cells of those that were sexually active compared to the ones that weren't, they actually grew in more brain cells. And this is uh, in just a few months. So our, our bodies are so much more dynamic than we had once realized. Your skin gets more blood when you eat and live healthier. So you, you, uh, you don't age as quickly. You know, I'm 94 years old. I don't know if, if I'm pretty good. Um, <laughs> in fact, one of the, um, Christy Turlington, the uh, supermodel, has a wonderful uh, website called smokingisugly.com because her father died of lung cancer. It turns out that nicotine makes your arteries constrict. People wonder sometimes, how is it that smoking gives me a heart attack? I can certainly understand how it gives me lung cancer, but why, how, how does it get to my heart? Because the nicotine in cigarettes makes your arteries constrict. So in your heart, that can cause a heart attack. In your brain, it can cause a stroke. But in your face, it makes the arteries constrict that um, feed your skin, and so it makes you wrinkle faster, and it gives you that kind of gray pallor. So instead of making you look beautiful, it actually makes you look ugly. And she did it, Chrissy did it, say, uh, a little uh, public service announcement that I want to just show you that I really like. Um, pictures. Yeah, you can take pictures. Dark as midnight. <laughs> Dark as midnight. Black as coal. It's really clingy. Oh, it's, it's really clingy. It clings to you. Okay. It clings to you. Black as coal. Sorry. Off this way? Pictures? Yeah, you can take a picture. And if you keep using it, it'll completely change your look. 
Smoking is ugly. Now, the other thing that smoking does that a lot of guys are surprised to find out is it makes you impotent. Half of guys who smoke have problems with their sexual function because, again, it constricts your blood vessels. It's the anti-Viagra. Viagra dilates your blood vessels. That's why it makes you more potent. But nicotine constricts it. And the, one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was not smoking causes emphysema, lung cancer, heart attacks. If you go to the UK, you buy these packages of cigarettes, they have these photographs on them with people with you know, tracheotomies and half their faces removed just to try to scare you into not smoking. But again, fear isn't sustainable. This is what works. This was a great ad that the, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that the Department of Health Services in California did. You notice the limp cigarette here. Um, it doesn't say heart attack, emphysema, it says impotence. So instead of making, you know, cigarettes are marketed to make you look, they say, you know, you'll be sexy and beautiful and cool if you smoke. It said it makes you ugly and impotent. That takes it away from the fear base of what might happen in the future to what happens to you right now that's not so fun. And so that's a much more effective way of going about it. Because again, there's no point in giving up something unless you get something back that's even better. Here again, the major determinant of improvement wasn't how old they were or how sick they were in our studies, it was how much they changed. The more you change, the more you improve in every way we can measure, and the more you change, the better you feel, and again, the better you feel, the more you want to keep making these changes. So, if you, if you take these principles and you apply them to diet, diets don't work. Diets are all about what you can't have and what you must do, and so they don't really work very well. If you go on a diet, chances are you're gonna go off a diet. It's just a question of when. And then when you get off the diet, you feel bad, like, oh, I couldn't do it, what's wrong with me? And you feel all that kind of shame and guilt and humiliation, which are among the most toxic emotions, and that doesn't work. So I came up with this idea called a spectrum, and to say, instead of saying, eat this and don't eat that, which we already found don't, doesn't work, like don't eat the apple, and do this and don't do that, and all that sense of deprivation and shame that goes along with it. And once you call foods good or bad, it's a very small step to thinking I'm a bad person because I ate bad food. I mean, I can't go out to dinner with somebody uh, you know, apologizing for what they're eating or commenting on what I'm eating, I have to say, you know, you are forgiven. I'm not the food police here, but still there's all this, you know, moralistic stuff around food. I cheated on my diet, all that stuff. That's not helpful. Food is just food. Food is not, it's not a moral issue. But some foods are healthier for you than others. And so what I did is I categorized foods from the most healthful group one to the least healthful group five. And so what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. So if you decide one day, um, to get your cholesterol down 40 points, or you want to lose 10 pounds, or get your blood pressure down, say, okay, um, I'm eating mostly junk food, groups four and five. Maybe I'm not ready to go all the way to eating a plant-based diet, but I'll eat less junk food and more healthy food. So I'll eat less four and five and more one through three. I'm not, maybe I'm not ready to exercise an hour a day, but I'll, maybe I'll do 20 minutes a day. Maybe I can't meditate for 10 minutes. Maybe I'll do one minute. You know, whatever you do, the more you do, the more you improve. And then, so instead of me telling you what you should be doing, you tell me how much you want to change. I, I chaired uh, Google's health advisory board for several years, and so I got to spend time with a lot of really smart Google engineers. And so we tried to come up with all these complex algorithms to say, let's plug in all these questionnaires and your DNA testing and this and that, and say, here's your personalized program. And one day I thought, you know what? I'm just going about this in completely the wrong way. I don't, I don't know if you ever have those moments of insight where you realize you're doing it completely wrong. And I said, you know, I'm doing this completely wrong. Instead of me telling people what they should be doing, let them tell us what they want to do. Because as soon as I tell somebody what to do, there's pushback, you know, there's a power struggle. But you tell me how much you want to change, how quickly, how many things you want to change, and we'll support that degree of change. And then we'll track it. And if that degree of change is enough, great, you're there. And if not, you can do more. It's radically simple in that way. So if you want to get your cholesterol down 50 points or lose 10 pounds or whatever it is, so you make these moderate changes and you check it again in a month or so. And if that accomplishes your goal, great. If not, then you can either go on medication or make bigger changes. And then we just go through the the risks, the benefits, the costs, the side effects, and so on, and you decide how much you want to change. And then I don't have to be in this manipulative dance with you about trying to get you to do anything, because as soon as I try to get you to do something, you're going to push back and say it's all coming from you, and that makes it much more sustainable. So I just want to put a, a little 60-second uh, clip together that kind of summarizes this. I want to play for you.
So all foods are included, uh, nothing's excluded, but to the degree you move in that direction, there's a corresponding benefit. And so it's, you, you can't fail. There's no diet to get on, so there's no diet to get off. Now, you know, I've been a veteran of many of these diet debates and diet wars and so on, but there's a convergence of what, from most experts, about what constitutes an optimal way of eating, and it goes something like this. To the degree you can eat plants, um, you're better off because you get a double benefit. You're not eating the things that promote disease, like saturated fat, cholesterol, oxidants, inflammatory, things like that. And you're getting literally hundreds of thousands of protective substances, uh, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genosine, lycopene, et cetera, et cetera. These all have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, anti-aging properties. So if Michael Pollan likes to say, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it's made in a plant, avoid it. So try to eat foods as much as you can in their non-processed form. And use meat more as a flavoring, as a condiment, not as the center of your plate, uh, to the degree you can do that. The studies show that red meat consumption just makes everything worse. You're much more likely to get a heart attack, a stroke, pretty much all forms of cancer, et cetera. Now, I grew up in Texas eating meat three or five times a day, and I like it. And there, again, but I found when I stopped eating it or when I ate less of it, I felt better, and then it becomes more sustainable. Avoid processed foods with ingredients a third grader can't pronounce. If you can't pronounce it, chances are you shouldn't eat it. And uh, don't, ch don't eat breakfast cereals that change the color of the milk in the bowl. <laughs> One of my favorite. Uh oh what happened here? Let's see here. And if they give you little toys in there, that's probably also something else you might want to avoid here. Um, you want to reduce your intake of total fat, saturated fats, and trans fats, as well as sodium. And also you want to reduce your intake of refined carbohydrates, particularly sugar and concentrated sweeteners like high fructose corn syrup. And as we've been talking about, what we include in the diet is as important as what we exclude. Now, four grams a day of fish oil or equivalent um, is amazing. They provide what are called the omega-3 fatty acids, and they can reduce your risk of, heart, of sudden cardiac death by up to 80% just from that alone. And if you're a mom or you, you know, you're growing a baby or you're feeding a, breastfeeding a baby, the omega-3 fatty acids can... Uh, boost your child's IQ by up to 10 points. Amazing. And if you can give them, once they've been weaned from breastfeeding, you can give it to them in their, in their, in their breakfast food. Uh, calories count. Organic is better, both in terms of your health, but it tastes better. You know, you'd say broccoli. Most people go, ugh, broccoli, right? But if organic broccoli, I mean, people have no idea how good things can taste once you get away from the, the processed foods and the ones that are grown with all the pesticides and so on. And if you can pay a little more and get high-quality food, then you get more more pleasure with fewer calories, you know, because if the food tastes good, you don't need as much of it. And so you can enjoy your life even more and enjoy your food even more without getting fat in the process. And so, and particularly if you can make your food a form of meditation. So if you, I mean, we've all had experiences where you eat when you're on the run or in the car or watching a movie and eating popcorn and suddenly you kind of look down, the bag of popcorn's empty. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And you kind of go, who ate this? Because you were focusing on the movie, you weren't really paying attention to what you're eating. So you got all these calories that you really didn't even enjoy. So the other end of that is to say, if you really focus on what you're eating, like, you know, we both like dark chocolate, uh, I can get the best quality dark chocolate, really super fatty, but just a tiny piece of it, close my eyes. It's like drinking a fine wine. You don't just gulp it down. You, you invoke all your senses. You savor it, you smell it, you swirl it around, you look at the label. And so you get more pleasure with fewer calories when you eat mindfully, when you, when you eat with awareness. So how we eat is as important as what we eat. So you get more pleasure with fewer calories. Now, when you eat a lot of sugar, what happens is, when you go from, say, brown rice to white rice, a uh, complex carb to a refined carb, or you, or you go from uh, whole wheat flour to white flour, you've removed the fiber in the bran. And the fiber in the bran do some really good things. They fill you up before you get too many calories. You can only eat so many apples, you're going to get full before you get too many calories. But you can consume virtually unlimited amounts of sugar without getting full. So you get all these calories that don't fill you up. That's bad enough. But the other thing that the fiber in the bran do is they slow the absorption of the food from your gut into your blood. And so you get a nice, if you're charting your blood sugar over time, it just kind of goes up a little bit and it goes down a little bit. It gives you a nice constant source of energy throughout the day, which is good. But when you eat sugar, if you have a Coke or you know, a, a candy bar, your blood sugar gets absorbed, your food gets absorbed very quickly, so your blood sugar goes up really fast because you don't have the fiber in there to slow the absorption. So your blood sugar goes way up, which you see here, and that provokes your body to make insulin because of what's called um, homeostasis, that if it goes too up, then your body makes insulin to bring it back down. But it doesn't go down to where you started, it goes below where you started. It's like if you have a pendulum and you hold it one side and you let it go, it doesn't stop in the middle, it goes to the other side. So it goes up too high, 
your body makes insulin, it goes too low, which gives you that feeling like I need sugar, that carbohydrate craving, and so it becomes a vicious cycle. The other thing, but when you eat whole foods, you know, uh, whole grains and uh, fruits and vegetables and so on, in their natural forms, they're so rich in fiber that the food gets absorbed slowly and you don't reach those high levels up like up here that you do here that cause the, provoke the insulin response. And the problem with too much insulin is that insulin actually accelerates the conversion of calories into fat. It also promotes what's called chronic inflammation, which is the kind of redness and swelling when you bruise yourself, but also happens inside your body that can lead to heart disease and cancer in other states. And of course, it can lead to um, type 2 diabetes, which is epidemic in our culture. You know, a lot of people ask about the Atkins diet and these high carb, these uh, uh, high protein diets. And if this was in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, they actually looked at the arteries of people on different diets. On a diet like I've been recommending, the arteries are clear. On a typical American diet, they're kind of moderately blocked. And on an Atkins type diet, they're severely blocked. And so it doesn't show up in the cholesterol levels that they measure or in some of the other markers. But if you actually look at the arteries themselves, this is what you find. Now, Many of you are from, I think there are people from over 80 different countries, which is just amazing. And you know from other countries, and for those of you who travel and who've been stationed in other places, that there's this, what I call, globalization of chronic disease that's going on, as other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us, and all too often to die like us. And it, this has all happened in the last 20 years. Today, more people are dying from heart disease and type 2 diabetes in pretty much every country in the world including much of Africa, but especially in Asia, than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this has all happened in the last 20 years. And the irony is, is that the diet that we found that can reverse heart disease and cancer and change your genes and so on is essentially the way that people in third world countries were eating until they started to copy our diet. And so if we can get them to go back to what they were doing before, that would, that would be a, a really good thing. But sometimes they, they don't value their own culture because they see us as a superpower, they want to imitate us, and unfortunately they're copying our mistakes as well as our successes. And as I mentioned before, more people are dying today of heart disease and diabetes than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And so it's diverting a lot of resources from things that really do require drugs, like AIDS, TB, and malaria, to things that can be largely prevented, even reversed through simply changing diet and lifestyle. And the choices that we make in our own life actually affect everyone else's life too. What's good for you is good for the planet. What's Personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And if we look at three areas that are in crisis now, the energy crisis, the global warming crisis, and the health crisis, all intersect around what we eat and how we live. Let me tell you why. From an energy crisis standpoint, it turns out that 20% of the fossil fuel that we burn goes to make processed foods. And likewise, when you eat higher on the food chain, when you eat more meat, it takes 10 times more energy to produce an equivalent amount of protein. So if we ate if we had a meatless Monday, if we ate lower on the food chain, there is enough food today to feed the entire world. No one need go hungry if we can allocate our resources better. From the standpoint of uh, energy also, a quarter pounder with cheese takes 26 ounces of oil and, a, and leaves a 13 pound carbon fit, footprint, which is equivalent to burning seven pounds of coal for one burger. And so for many people, they find it's actually easier to do things for other people than for themselves. And, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by all these things, like what can I as one person do? Well, you can do a lot just by changing what you eat. It makes a difference. From a global warming standpoint, many people are surprised to learn that livestock consumption accounts for more global warming than all forms of transportation combined. And uh, it's responsible for 18% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions compared to only 13% oops, for the entire uh, 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 transportation. Uh, let me get back to where I was here. I used to have these arguments with Al Gore because he was on the Atkins diet and he loved to eat meat and, uh, he, because he didn't want to talk about livestock. And, and, and was, I said, you can be driving a Prius, but if you're eating a burger, you're still actually not, 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 not doing as well as somebody who's e eating a healthier diet. So now he's, he's doing that. From a health crisis standpoint, it turns out that three quarters, 75% of the $2.7 trillion that we spend each year on healthcare are for chronic diseases that can be largely reversed or prevented through changing diet and lifestyle. Now, there's this debate going on in Washington. Many Democrats are saying, let's just raise taxes and let the deficit go up to provide healthcare. Many Republicans saying, let's just dismantle Medicare or privatize it. They're not going to come to an agreement, you know, they're, so they're just at loggerheads. But we're saying, wait a minute, there's a third alternative here. If we can turn off the faucet around the sink that's overflowing by treating the cause of what's making us sick, in other words, our diet and lifestyle, we can make better healthcare available to more people at lower cost 
and the only side effects are good ones. Again, we have new choices. Just as an example of how powerful these changes are, this was a large study in, the, in one of the AMA's uh, lead journals that 23,000 men and women just walking a half an hour a day, not smoking, easily, eating a reasonably healthy diet, and keeping a healthy weight prevented 93% of diabetes, 81% of heart attacks, and so on. And these aren't even big changes in lifestyles, but they go a long way. And we spend trillions of dollars on these. Now, I mentioned before that <clears throat> cardiovascular diseases kill more people around the world than pretty much everything else combined, and yet it's completely preventable today for at least 95% of people and probably closer to 99% of people. I mean, it's staggering when you think about the disease that kills more people than everything else combined is completely preventable today if we just put into practice what we already know. We don't need to wait for a new breakthrough, a new, a new uh, laser, a new high-tech drug. We just need to change our diet and lifestyle. Now, how do we treat heart disease in this country? Well, we do a lot of drugs and surgery. In 2006, which is the last year we have data, over a million angioplasties were done at a cost of $60 billion. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's, that's a lot of money, but think of all the lives that it saves. So maybe it's worth it, except it doesn't. The major studies, including in the New England Journal of Medicine, have shown that angioplasties and stents, unless you're in the middle of having a heart attack, which 95% of people who get them are not, they don't prolong life, they don't prevent heart attacks, they don't even reduce chest pain, and we spent $60 billion. Bypass surgery is the same thing. Uh, also in New England Journal of Medicine, major studies show that uh, bypass surgery didn't prolong life either. Now, that's $100 billion for two operations that are dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. Okay, so at the same time that all these studies are showing that um, heart disease uh, treatments don't work that well. The cartoon says, I can operate or you can go on a strict diet. He says, we better operate because my insurance doesn't cover a strict diet. That's been the problem. Um, that we talk about evidence-based medicine, but so often reimbursement is a real driver of medical practice. And so we're finding now that at the same time that the drugs and surgery are not working that well, the diet and lifestyle changes are working better than anybody dreamed of. Now, childhood obesity is another major threat. The uh, former Surgeon General called it the terrorist threat from within. And the reason is, is that Many people are shocked to hear that this may be the first generation in which our kids live a shorter lifespan than their parents. And that's, that's pitiful. I mean, it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. Uh, every parent wants their kid to do well and to excel them, to live well. And this is the kind of thing that really gets people's attention. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, our genes haven't changed in that period of time. It's been our diet that's been changing. It turns out that two-thirds of adults and over 15% of kids are overweight or obese. And Diabetes in 30-year-olds has risen 70% in the last decade. In fact, a recent study showed that overweight teens had the arteries of someone that was 35 years older than they were. So that's how bad the problem is, and we all need to find a way to do something about that. And likewise, healthcare costs, which are really sick care costs, are reaching a tipping point, not only in the government, but also in the corporate world. Uh, the CEO of Starbucks said, they, we spend more money on healthcare for our employees than we do for coffee beans. Mars Candy spends more than they do for sugar, and they, General Motors spends more for healthcare than they do for steel. And so it's reaching a tipping point that we can do something about that. Uh, and seven years ago, Steve Bird, the CEO of Safeway, approached me because he was helping to fund some of our, of our early research and said, you know, Dean, we're spending 120% of our net revenues on healthcare for our employees. That's not sustainable. And so we put in the work site some of these practices, and their costs came down 12% in the first year, and they've remained essentially flat since then. And so, because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, you can see cost savings very quickly. In fact, we did a demonstration project with Mutual of Omaha, and we found that most people could avoid the surgery that they were told they needed, and they saved actually $30,000 per patient in the first year. Uh, we did a study with Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they found that compared to a control group, the costs were the same at the beginning. After one year, the costs were down 50%. So if we're spending $2.7 trillion on healthcare, and we can cut the costs by half in one year simply by changing diet and lifestyle, you can see that it provides all kinds of ways of reducing the deficit that don't make these painful choices that we're talking about, that we can all come together on. We found that we're getting 85 to 90% adherence to a very intensive lifestyle program at all these sites in West Virginia, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania, again, because we're, people feel so much better when they do that. And as Colonel Williams mentioned, Medicare is now covering our program as of January a year ago. It's the only time Medicare has covered a lifestyle program like this, and we're very grateful. It took 16 years of review uh, before they finally approved it, but they did. And we may be expanding that coverage to include uh, other conditions as well. If you're interested in learning more about this, there, our nonprofit institute's uh, website has all these uh, 
downloadable meditations you can do and recipes and menus and scientific research uh, reprints, anything you want, it's all there, check it out. And by the way, if, um, because I have such great respect for what you're doing, if any of you have questions that we don't have time to talk about in the Q&A period, just email me personally, put Army War College in the subject heading, and that way I'll make sure I personally respond to you and just give me your question. My personal email is uh, dean, D-E-A-N, uh, dot Ornish, O-R-N-I-S-H, dean dot Ornish at P-M-R-I dot org. It stands for Preventive Medicine Research Institute. So dean dot Ornish at P-M-R-I dot org. Put Army War College in the subject heading, and I'll be sure to, uh, to respond to you personally. It may not happen right away, but I promise I'll get back to you. When we look at the data from now several thousand patients, from beginning to 12 weeks to one year, a continued weight loss of 16 pounds over the course of the year. We found their chest pain fell dramatically. Their ability to exercise rose within the first few weeks and stayed up. You know, the old joke is, uh, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I change my diet and lifestyle? And uh, we're finding that the quality of life improves dramatically as well as the, uh, the length of life. Systolic blood pressure goes way down. Uh, diastolic blood pressure goes way down as well. And so these are continued improvements over time, and the diabetes begins to improve as well. The last thing I want to talk about is, in many ways, the most important, that there's a real epidemic, uh, not just of heart disease and obesity and cancer, but of loneliness and depression and isolation. I got profoundly depressed when I was in college, and uh, I, I, was at, I grew up in Texas, went to a little school called Rice University in Houston, and um, what they didn't tell me when I enrolled there was that they had the highest suicide rate of any school in the country per capita. It wasn't in their course catalog, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but I learned why, actually. Um, and my college roommate was one of the four people in the country who scored a perfect score on his SATs that year, and he never had to study. And I had an organic chemistry professor that was, I was sure had um, escaped Nazi Germany and came to Houston instead of Argentina to be my teacher. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, um, and he told us on the first day of class, this is a weed out course and I'm going to weed you out. I don't know if you've ever had professors like that. And look to the left and look to the right and uh, one of you won't be here you know, by the end of the semester. And I thought, great, because you know, I really wanted to be a doctor and I knew that I had to do well in organic chemistry. And the more I studied, the more I worried, the harder it became to study. And the harder it became to study, the more I worried. And I got into this vicious cycle where I literally couldn't sleep for a week straight, which is enough to make you crazy. That's why when they torture people, they don't let them sleep for long periods of time, because it really does make you nuts. And so I just remember thinking one day, you know, why don't I just kill myself and then I'll be happy, you know, then I'll be peaceful, because everyone who's dead looks like they're pretty peaceful. And so um, I figured it's got to be better than this. And I felt like I was stupid and somehow I'd managed to fool people into thinking that I was smart and now that I was in a school with a bunch of really smart people, they were going to figure out what a mistake they'd made in letting me in. Does that sound familiar to anyone here? <laughs> so I... Um, and then I had this spiritual vision, which is that nothing can bring lasting happiness. And I thought, wow, the combination of feeling like I'm never going to amount to anything, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter anyway, was a little bit uh, overpowering. So I um, was all set to do it, and I got so sick physically from, uh, from mononucleosis that I didn't have the energy to kill myself. My parents got wind that I wasn't doing well. They saw what a wreck I was. I went home to Dallas to recuperate. And meanwhile, my uh, older sister had been studying uh, meditation and yoga with his spiritual teacher. So my parents decided to have a cocktail party for the Swami, which was kind of strange in Dallas in 1971, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> and he came into our living room and, and he said, uh, nothing can bring you lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out, except he looked really happy and I was a wreck. And he said, but you don't need those things, you have it already. That in one of the great ironies of our life, we end up running after all these things that we think are gonna make us happy, and we end up disturbing what we could have already if we just stopped doing that. And that in one of the supreme ironies, we end up disturbing what's there already. And that the goal of all spiritual practices, whether they're religious or secular, is ultimately to quiet down our mind and body so that we can experience what it means to be peaceful and healthy, not because we got something we thought we needed, but rather that's our natural state. And it's a very empowering thing because, you know, people only have power over you, personal power over you, if they have something that you feel like you've got to have. And so the less you need, the more power you have. Somebody says, if you don't do this, I'm not going to do that. You say, well, that's okay. I don't really need that. And suddenly they don't control you anymore. You can walk away from anything. And so the paradox in all these things is that, these, that the, the more inwardly defined you are, the more power you hold on to and you retain. And the better you become at commanding your troops because they see that in you. They feel that sense of groundedness and security that 
You're not looking to other people to define who you are. You have that already. And the problem is, is that when people are lonely and depressed, they are many times more likely to get sick and die prematurely, in part because um, they're more likely to abuse themselves. You know, I, I'd ask people, why do you smoke and overeat and drink too much and work too hard and abuse substances? These behaviors seem so uh, maladaptive to me. And they'd say, Dean, you don't get it. You don't have a clue. These behaviors aren't maladaptive. They're very adaptive because they help us get through the day. You know, they say things like, I've got uh, 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes, and they're always there for me, and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? Or food fills that void, or alcohol numbs that pain, or working all the time numbs the pain, or video games numb the pain, or, you know, watching TV. We have so many ways of, of numbing or killing or bypassing pain, literally and figuratively. But, you know, to me, the pain is there for a reason. It's to say, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And so we found that just giving people information is not enough. If it were, nobody would smoke. Everybody knows that smoking is bad for you. It's on every pack of cigarettes. So we need to work at a deeper level, which is to work at the, the loneliness, the depression, the isolation. That there's been a real radical shift in our culture in the last 50 years with the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people a sense of connection and community. You know, it used to be 50 years, 60 years ago, people would have a, a neighborhood where they had two or three generations of people living together. They knew you. They'd have an extended family they'd see regularly. Many people don't even have a nuclear family they see regularly. And in the military, you're sent all over the world. You hardly see your family for very long at all. You know, they don't have a church or synagogue they go to regularly. They don't have a job that feels secure. And so these things really make a difference not only in the quality of our lives, but actually in our survival. So let me show you um, where it really comes to home is here in the military. Um, 18 veterans kill themselves every day. Every day, 18 veterans. Think about that for a minute. And one active duty soldier commits suicide every day somewhere in the world, in, this, in the American military. Now, that's, we can do better. And I know what it feels like to be depressed because I almost killed myself. And the worst thing about being depressed is it creates this reality distortion field where, you know, if you're just sad, you feel like, I'm sad, but, you know, things will get better. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but they'll get better. But if you're really depressed, you, you have this distortion that you feel like things are bad, they've always been bad, all the times you thought they'd ever be good, you were just fooling yourselves, and they're never going to be any better. And that's that uh, helplessness and hopelessness that's a hallmark of depression comes from that. And so we need to pay attention. And as commanding officers and as leaders in the military, you need to be mindful of your, your soldiers' mental health as well as their physical health, because it, their survival may be at stake. And these are the more extreme examples. But if you look at the effects of depression on causing people to get sick and die prematurely, that number will be much bigger. Now, as I mentioned, information is important, but it's not enough. Now, let me just show you a handful of studies, or thousands of these, that show you what a powerful difference these, this makes. Six months after a heart attack, those that were depressed, 17% of them were dead. Those that weren't, 3% were dead. That's almost a six-fold difference in mortality six months after a heart attack, independent of their diet, their smoking, and other behaviors. That's how powerful depression is in terms of affecting our physical health. So we need to pay attention to that. And most doctors don't even bother to ask their patients if they're depressed, because most doctors are depressed these days. You know, it's unfortunate. So you need to pay attention. You need to ask your, the, the men and the women that you command, you know, how are you feeling? You know, we think our feelings are kind of soft and squishy and maybe wimpy, but it's our feelings that connect us and our feelings that really drive us, for better and for worse, and our feelings ultimately that affect our health and our well-being for better and for worse. And that's where your job is to help guide people into healthier ways of feeling and being. One study showed that the more people felt loved and supported, the less blockage they had in their arteries, again, independent of their diet, their smoking, and other behaviors. And when you're depressed, your immune system is depressed. People who are depressed, their natural killer cell activity, their T lymphocyte, B lymphocyte activity is all depressed as well. And, and one a dramatic example of that at uh, UCSF, uh, Dr. Margaret Chesney found that men and women who were HIV positive, who were depressed, had more than double the likelihood of getting sick and dying from AIDS than those who weren't. So again, depression kills, not only in terms of suicide, but in terms of other things. Now, what can you do about that? Well, meditation is really good. But support in community is the most powerful antidote to depression, okay? This was a study they did of women with metastatic breast cancer at Stanford. And they, they all had metastatic breast cancer. They're all in the same chemo and radiation and surgery, but 
In addition, they, they randomly divided the women into two groups, and one group met together for an hour and a half once a week for a year in a supportive environment where they were encouraged to talk about their feelings in a group of, with the other group of women who had cancer as well. They did that for one year. They thought this would improve the quality of their life, which it did, but the guy who did it, David Spiegel, said, I, I almost fell off the floor, he said, when I looked at the data. Five years later, it didn't just improve the quality of their lives. Those women lived twice as long as the women who didn't have the support group. Now, <clears throat> a skeptic might say, oh, come on, give me a break. You mean sitting around with a bunch of women and talking away about my feelings is going to help me live longer if I've got cancer? Come on, please. But that's what the data show, and other studies have replicated that because we are touchy-feely creatures. It's easy to make fun of, but that's who we are. That's how we've survived as a species, by learning to help each other and by supporting each other and nurturing each other. And that may sound antithetical to be talking about the power of love at the Army War College, but that's where it, it really comes together. I mean, seriously. Because <clears throat> when, let me just show you a couple other studies and then I'll talk about that. That anything that creates intimacy is really healing in every sense of the word. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are very old ideas that we're rediscovering. And if you look at the spiritual truths that you find in all major religions, all minor religions too for that matter, they all, you know, once you get past the rituals that people fight and kill each other over, the uh, underlying principles are really the same. They're all about altruism and forgiveness and compassion and love, because that's what unites us. That's what frees us from our suffering. In the very first study I did, uh, when I was a medical student 35 years ago, I um, had 10 men and women and put them in a hotel for a month. And one guy was a 75-year-old dentist who hated gay men, and of course, one of the other men was gay. This was in Houston, and they, the one guy said some awful things to the second guy, and the other guy said some equally awful things back, and they both got chest pain. One clutched their chest and took a nitroglycerin, the other clutched his chest, took a, a Demerol. One slammed the door with that way, the other slammed the door this way. I thought they were both going to collapse and die, and this was going to be the end of my very short research career. Um, so I talked to them. I said, you know, you're giving the power to give you chest pain and maybe a heart attack and die to the guy you hate the most. That's not really smart. And so for your own self-interest, I want you to be more loving, more tolerant, more compassionate to this other guy, because that's what's going to free you of that suffering. It doesn't condone or forgive the bad things that other people do, but it frees you from the consequences of that. Is that selfish or is that unselfish? It's both. It's the wrong question. It's both. And so we teach people those things that to help use the experience of suffering as a catalyst for transforming our lives, because change is hard. But if you're in enough pain, and, and if somebody can help you direct that pain into a constructive way, which is what you all can do with the people that you command, it can be transformative for them. And I've heard people say, you know, getting a diagnosis of cancer, a heart attack, was the best thing that ever happened to me. Or, or you know, being sent off to fight somewhere was the best thing that ever happened to me. What do you go, what are you, crazy? And they say, no, that's what it took to get my attention to transform my lives in ways that make such a powerful difference in the world. And ultimately, I think that's why we're here, we're all going to die. To me, it's more importantly not just how long we live, but how well we live. And we can move from illness that's focused on the I to wellness that's focused on the we. It's powerful. Now, I asked, now I can say these things, but I'm a you know, doctor from California. It's easy to say, oh, this guy's a, you know, was from California. What does he know about you know, the army and the military? But I asked um, that, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, who uh, is not a wuss, to um, comment on the power of love, because I figured to have more credibility coming from him. And, uh, and, I, and he made this little short video that I'd like to play for you. Let me just uh, back this up. If you could turn the volume up just a bit on that. Maybe I'll do that here. Here we go. Dean, this is Stan McCrystal. Thanks for letting me be a part of your presentation today on the power of love. It's not something you'd normally hear in a military gathering, but I don't think it's inappropriate. I go back to my early days in my career, and I think all of us experienced this, there were leaders who would use negative or coercive leadership, sometimes through fear or intimidation, to try to, to, try to get us to do whatever it is they wanted us to do. What I found through experience, and it was first taught to me by Major General Bill Garrison, was that no matter how much fear we create in subordinates, that's just not strong enough to force them into actions when they're more scared of something else, particularly a situation like combat. When the chance of being injured or killed by the enemy is great, any fear they have of their chain of command is likely to, to be very insignificant. What we find, of course, is that in the end, soldiers react to what they feel strongly about. They react to positive leadership, they react to positive values, 
They react to a positive environment created around them, and they react to a positive example from leaders that they respect and leaders they care deeply about. In a sense, soldiers do what they feel strongly about, and it really gives to the idea, it's the power of the positive aspect. It's they do what they want to do, not what they're scared to do. So I think the power of love is appropriate. Thanks, Steve. All the best. So, whoops, sorry. So let me just uh, get this back. Oops, one more time. Dean, this is Stan. Sorry. So what, what General Crystal is saying to me is that you can try to scare your soldiers all you want, but that you can't scare them as much as somebody shooting at them is. And if you want, your, if you want people to, if you, if you manage through fear, fear is not sustainable, as we've been talking about. In, 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 in your diet, it's not sustainable on the battlefield either. That, but if you want people to, to die for you, then they, if they love you, they will die for you. If they love you, they will do anything for you. If they love you, they will find meaning in this very, very hard work that they're doing. And to me, that is one of the most important things you can do as a leader, is to embody those traits yourself. If you can be compassionate with the people that you work with, if you can be loving towards them, they will, you will, it will come right back to you. And it's the most powerful force in the universe, as far as I'm concerned. And whether it's changing your diet, whether it's commanding a battalion, whether it's being a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whatever mo uh, role you find yourself in, if you can bring love into that equation, you're going to be able to do that job much more effectively. And so I want to thank Colonel Williams and to all of you for this privilege of being here today. If I can be of any service to you, I'd be honored to do that. If you have any questions for me, uh, email them to me. We have about five minutes now, but I just want to end by saying thank you for this chance to be of service. I hope it's been useful. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I'd welcome them. Yes, sir. That's a good question. There's lots of different kinds of heart disease, but when most people refer to heart disease, they mean coronary heart disease, and that means your heart's not getting enough blood flow to feed itself. And the heart pumps blood to the body, but it first pumps blood to itself first. It's actually a nice metaphor. It's like sometimes I'll say, what organ does your heart pump blood to first? People think it's your brain or your, your lungs or other organs, you know, depending on your orientation. Um, but it's actually, it, it, it pumps blood to feed itself first through the coronary arteries. And the, it, it, it gets blood, which uh, carries the oxygen, and the oxygen is the fuel for the heart. So if it becomes clogged, then it can't feed itself. And so if it's temporary, you may get chest pain. If it's for more than a few hours, the part of the heart downstream from that blockage can die and turn into scar tissue. That's what a heart attack is. Other, yes, sir. It's true for all tobacco. Can you all hear the questions? The question is, uh, I talked about the effects of smoking. Uh, is that true for all tobacco products? And the answer is yes. Uh, because of the nicotine, if you use chewing tobacco, in some ways you actually get a higher dose than if you smoke it. And by the way, nicotine is actually more physiologically addictive than crack. It's harder to get off nicotine than it is off to get off heroin or cocaine. Yes, sir. What is the relationship between dental health and heart disease? Some studies are showing that if you've got bad gum disease, it creates a chronic inflammatory state. And inflammation is a substrate for a lot of uh, conditions, including heart disease. So if you take care of your teeth, you're actually taking care of your heart as well. Yes, ma'am. I actually know a lot about high fructose corn syrup because I chaired PepsiCo's health advisory board for several years to try to encourage them to make healthier products and to stop marketing junk food to kids, which fortunately they did. Um, but high fructose corn syrup is really equivalent to sugar. It's, it's, uh, what makes it so um, bad is that it's so cheap and it's so plentiful, and so they put it in everything. But switching from high fructose corn syrup to sugar isn't really going to accomplish very much. They're both equally bad. 
Time for one last question. Yes, sir. <laughs> How about sugar substitutes for those of us with a sweet tooth? They're better, but they have their own set of problems. And it turns out that studies show that when people use artificial sweeteners, they still eat as much sugar as they did before because it perpetuates a taste for sweet foods. I think it's better off to, if you need a sugar fix, to take a small piece of some really good treat that you like and just meditate on that. You know, seriously. <laughs> For me, it's dark chocolate. For you, it might be something else. And just really invoke all your senses, and it should, can be exquisite. The first bite is always the best anyway, right? And if you only have one bite or two bites, it can be exquisitely satisfying, but you don't get all the, the sugar and all the calories. Again, email me if I can help you. Thanks for the chance to be here today. I really appreciate it.